Welcome back to DWeb Decoded, a podcast by Filecoin Foundation that explores the intersection of blockchain and the data economy. I'm your host, Aaron Stanley, and today I'm joined by Stefan Vervat, who's the CEO of Akave. Stefan, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Great. So to get started, why don't you just give us the elevator pitch for what you're building with Akave? Yeah, for sure. So Akave is an L2 storage chain, and uh, we're enabling customers with uh, an easy um, network of on-ramps that allow um, users to like manage their data at scale, specifically for decentralized AI workloads. Um, we've built it on top of Filecoin so that we can uh, store data on Falcon because Falcon has a lot of great primitives and a very large network. And so it's really, um, you can see it as almost like a hot storage layer that allows users to easily ingest data through an object-based interface and has a ton of other tools as well to easily manage data at scale. Awesome. So I want to dive into your kind of your background a little bit here, because you've been in the world of data storage and data server data services uh, for basically your entire career. And you've been kind of on like the, both the enterprise side and on the startup side uh, of a lot of that. So you've seen a lot of, I feel like you have a really interesting perspective here on, on just how innovation happens, both on the, the startup innovator side, and then how enterprises actually adopt those, those, those innovations, right? So I would love for you to talk a bit about your trajectory in this world and then how you arrived in Filecoin ultimately. Yeah. So yeah, 20 years in storage, uh, done two startups, uh, mostly in distributed storage and um, like content addressable um, storage techniques. And so when it, it was natural for me to like move over to uh, Protocol Labs, uh, where I've ran uh, the growth of the network. So I was head of network growth for like three years, uh, with a goal to expand the Falcon network. Um uh, learned a ton, uh, had a lot of fun. Um, we've built an awesome network. And so what we saw in the last three years is that users, you can have the, the greatest technology and the greatest features, uh, but you can only typically move as fast as users want to move. And what we've seen in the last three years is that users really want sort of like this um, hybrid version of um, Web3 in the sense that they want to move their data sets from the cloud or on-premises into a Web3 native storage stack, but they want to do that through interfaces that they they know, um, and typically those are object storage interfaces, um, and then build from there. So what we've done in the last uh, you know last year is when we start building Akave is really to help users to move uh, their data sets more easily into uh, Filecoin and into Web3 native products or Web2 native. Uh, solutions. Um, and this is where Akave came to life because after so many conversations with users that came to Falcon and said, hey, I really like what Falcon has to offer. I really want the data integrity, the, the uh, on-chain verifiability, um, you know, the better cost structure and so on. But please give me just an interface that I know for now. And then I will upgrade my tools and adopt myself to all the, the cool stuff, like the smart contracts and stuff that I um, that I would like to use. So, um, yeah, so this is where we got today. Uh, and very excited now to running the ship of Akave and building out um, tools to help customers bring their data sets on chain because that's really our mission, um, help users to bring all data sets on chain. And it's a big undertaking. And uh, so, so, yeah, that's where we're at today. So, Maybe talk a bit more about the enterprise adoption curve when it comes to like to new data storage solutions and and, and paradigms. Even and I, I've heard you talk about this in the past few times uh, back in the two thousands, right? Just how difficult it was to convince people to to move their data to the cloud versus storing it on premise, right? And it, looking back, right. it seems kind of crazy. Like why would like everyone use this cloud now without even thinking about it? But um, maybe talk a bit about the, some of the parallels you see between you know, getting people to adopt these new solutions in that era versus now? Um, yeah, so uh, look, what, like 15 years ago, or what is it, 17 years ago right now, Amazon came out with S3. And at the time, a lot of users or businesses said, hey, nobody's going to store their data sets in the cloud. That's ridiculous. Why would you pass on your most precious data sets to a third party and uh, performance will be bad and, and so there's a lot of like uh, 
debates on like whether that would take off. And, you know, of course, history is, pro- like, if you look back now, you know, it's, it's proven that that was the, the solution that everyone eventually jumped on. And, and right now the cloud providers are managing most of the large, uh, most of the data sets and applications in the world. Um, definitely if you look at, you know, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, uh, Tencent Cloud, Ali Cloud, all these large hyperscalers, they really absorb not just data sets, but also the application workloads. And, and interestingly enough, like whenever that adoption happens, um, you have like, I mean, you always have like the early adopters and so on, but you know, there's solutions that are completely built from scratch that you wouldn't, you, you were not, or are not able to build with traditional infrastructure. And so that happened in the cloud and it's happening now in Web3 as well, right? Where you have these, you know, native Web3 native applications being built from the ground up on decentralized infrastructure with completely different tools like smart contracts and everything's written in code and it's a completely different paradigm shift. Um, and it, but it takes time. It takes time to see these businesses grow. And then you have sort of like the traditional um, Web 2 uh, businesses that are starting to look now at Web 3 um, specifically because they're seeing some of the cost benefits. They're seeing some of the the challenges with uh, regulation um, where, you know, uh, definitely with these new AI workloads, there's a lot more um, uh, new laws that are being put forward where hyperscalers will be required. Um, there's actually one in February where the Department of Commerce uh, actually suggested uh, that hyperscalers should start to report on um, all AI, LLM workloads and uh, these new reporting requirements will you know, require these hyperscalers to, you know, expose a lot more information from uh, these businesses that are training their LMs and using more advanced AI in the hyperscalers. And that could also like drive more, you know, users and businesses to look at alternative solutions. And we were already seeing that. And it's not just on the storage side, but we're also seeing it on the compute side where confidential computing is, is sort of taking off right now. Um, but yeah, there's a couple of things like, you know, 17 years ago, adoption, right, was like initially uh, driven by um, a cheaper cost and, you know, ease of use because you could uh, move to an OPEX model when you moved into the cloud. Today, I think it's more because businesses starting to realize the value of their data sets and they're starting to, to value the importance of controlling and, and not just controlling the data sets, but also monetizing it and really starting to take advantage of these LLMs and uh, training their own LLMs based on their own data sets, which means that they're also more careful about where those data sets are stored, how they're managed, how they're exposed, um, and how they are, uh, in some cases, shared with other parties uh, to, to create a yield from. And so all of this opens up opportunities to... Web3 technologies because blockchain enabled infrastructure comes with a lot of primitives that, you know, are not uh, cheap when you look at or not easy to implement when you look at cloud. So it, it sounds like the, the the recurring theme here between these two eras, if you will, is that that the the users, the clients, they're the, the holders of these data sets, they, they, they recognize the value of what they own, right? And they're very they're thinking of like what's the best way to both secure as well as uh, potentially monetize this right so back twenty years ago it was like this is this is my data set this is very valuable why would I just stick why would I just ex, you know give this to some third party to to store for me that's crazy I, I'm going to hold it myself and then now people are thinking of like well what's the best way to maximize the benefits of this data set uh, instead of perhaps just um, maybe you know stuffing under the mattress, so to speak, right? If, yeah. if it's your savings, right? Like how, how, okay, I have it, but like how, what can I do with it now that I have it? That, that creates value. Uh, so there's lots of interesting parallels there that I think is helpful um, for us to always kind of keep in mind when we're looking at these things. And sometimes it's like, why aren't people adopting this stuff faster? It's like, well, these enterprises are inherently uh, perhaps not the most, uh, you know, risk on uh, pro customer profiles, right? To be doing these types of things, but uh, but we are getting there, right? I think the paradigm is shifting. People are understanding uh, just what you know, what they what they actually own, and what what the value of what they what they hold is, and how they can be best managing and protecting that, monetizing it. Um, so let's talk a bit about what Akave is building right now. 
Um, yeah. And I would love for you to describe this concept of a, a data lake. And uh, yeah. maybe even for the lay person, like what does that mean exactly? Yeah, I would say like uh, in the introduction, what I should have said is, uh, because that's very much our focus, is uh, with Akave, we really, we really are enabling customers to um, implement on-chain data lakes. And so the concept of a data lake has been there for a very long time. It really comes down to like a very, you know, central or not centralized, but a, a, a big repository of, of uh, data sets uh, that are stored in their original format. So the whole point is that you have this sort of like uh, location where you can store raw, unstructured and structured data sets at scale. And you can store them in their native format. And you want that because once you start using those data sets, you want the original format so that you can process it in any workload that you want to execute, whether it's an ELT workload, whether it's a database that where you want to run SQL queries on. So basically, you have different sources all stored in the same pool. And then you know that as you have more data sets, more sources, you can also improve your outcome and your insights right, uh, or, or your findings when you run analytics on it. So these data lakes, um, they, they're they not easy to manage. Uh, object storage has been, um, in the last 10 years, like a, a common repository, a common storage technology or common storage interface for these data lakes to be managed. And um, we believe that in the future and now we're seeing that kind of transition happening where users are a lot more aware of how that data is managed under the hood, and it's more than just the interface. Meaning, if you store it in the cloud, right, you sort of like trust the cloud. It's an object interface. It was primarily like today. A lot of customers are focused on cost. How can I easily scale with my business? What is the ongoing uh, cost to to move it around? Because moving data is extremely expensive. Once you reach a certain scale, the cost of moving is sometimes higher, or in a lot of cases, higher after. Definitely, if you're talking about petabytes, the actual cost of moving it is much higher than storing it, uh, storing an extra copy. And so there's this this balance where you're starting to look at, okay, well, maybe it makes sense for me to store it at different locations. Maybe it makes sense to store a local copy so they don't have like a vendor lock in with the hyperscalers because if you want to move your data out of the cloud, it's extremely expensive. I was talking to a customer yesterday. They said, hey, we've got 500 terabyte at Amazon Glacier it's costing me $30,000 just to read one copy out and move it out of the cloud. So the conversation is more about like, how do I preserve? How do I get these data sets back before it becomes a bill that I no longer can pay for? And so I'm really locked in there. So the point is, you know, when implementing a data lake, you have to look at a few things. One, is it cost efficient at scale? Not when you start, but at scale. Two, is it, uh, does it have the data protection uh, capabilities built in, meaning does it have like, you know, 11 nines of durability? Do I have distributed? Uh, do I have like um, data center failure protection? And can I store multiple data sets so that I can just dump basically all my files in there and my database logs and so on? And so really um, what we're doing with Akave is to bring that capability through an object interface and uh, by enabling it with a blockchain powered storage network and by enabling Filecoin as a backhand storage architecture behind it, um, we can actually provide users with a solution that allows them to ingest all their data sets through this object interface. And at the same time, whether it's unstructured, structured, or you know, semi-structured data sets, we actually index these files in a content addressable way because one of the benefits of blockchain is that, you know, one, you get the immutability, you get on-chain proofs of, you know, uh, inte data integrity checks, but we index all the data uh, through cryptographic hashes, like the, the, the root CIDs or the, the SIDs as we talk about that, right? So these cryptographic hashes that represent the content, not necessarily the name of the file or the location of the file, but actually a cryptographic hash that's based on the content of the file um, and bring that on-chain so that users at all times have an on-chain proof or an on-chain reference point, a cryptographic hash in this case, that indicates, you know, yes, your file has been stored in this location. Oh, and, and by the way, your data has been verified and you can be rest assured that the data has been maintained in its original format and no one else can 
you know, make any changes to your data without you knowing it. So there's a combination of providing that scale and providing uh, the benefits of blockchain that, um, you know, that come with Filecoin and, and with Akave's uh, built-in chain. Great. Yeah, you alluded to my my next question, which was going to oh, be yeah. what would be the what would be the kind of the benefits of of a blockchain in like a data lake context if you're introducing things like cryptography <clears throat> and decentralization and and immutability and things of this nature. So you kind of front ran my question there, but yeah, that's great. Um, so talking about um, the stack that you guys are building, why don't you kind of walk through what you guys have? I know you have there's like the Akave Oasis, the Akave O3. Like, what are all these, what are these, some of these different products in the stack that you have uh, that you're building out? Yeah. So, I mean, you can go to akave.ai, um, but basically you have the foundation, which is the, we call it the Kave Oasis, uh, which is our, an, our L2. Uh, so it's its own blockchain. Um, it's currently built on IPC, interplanetary consensus. Um, the whole idea is that, um, you have the data validators, data managers. Um, and so data managers are managing data. So the concept of a node that is processing data, data comes in, it has a certain, uh, um, like an object storage interface, like an S3 compatible object interface. It, um, it, it executes on the policies because you as a user, what you're going to do is you're going to assign, uh, you're going to, you can, um, you can create a bucket, you can create an object storage bucket. You can sign it with your wallets, which is, again, where blockchain comes in. You can identify yourself with a wallet, meaning your wallet is your idea or it's your representation of your uh, digital self. And you're connecting that to your bucket. And on a bucket, you set policies or you set certain um, requirements over time. Right now, it's a very simple, I want to replicate it. I want to store it in the U.S. Um, very simple uh, actions right now. But the benefit here is that um, you have... Um, Oasis as a is a as a platform of storage nodes that will store the data and cache it, not caching but will store a fast copy, and as you replicate to Filecoin, those data managers will make sure that one copy is stored on Filecoin, and then uh, there is an on-chain proof that gets um, represented and reported back through the Akave stack. So for a user, they get an easy way to on uh, to move data into. Filecoin, um, because now, you know, when you want to store data in Filecoin, there is no out-of-the-box S3 compatible object store, or there is no out-of-the-box policies uh, that that provide you, that allow you to replicate. You either have to build it yourself, or you have to go to multiple storage providers in the Filecoin ecosystem and negotiate. So with Akave, you'll have a marketplace where you can select from like, oh, I've got, you know, some storage providers on the East Coast, some storage providers on the West Coast. I've got my own bucket. I'm just going to say I'm on two copies, one on the West and one on the East. And so you have your S3 interface and you can easily point your application to it. And because Akave 03, which is like you already mentioned it, is sort of like the component that um, provides the um, object storage, so the S3 compatible object storage gateway, um, that will actually do the transition. You can run that <coughs> gateway as well locally if you want to. Um, so if you, let's say you don't want to participate in the Akave data validators, or you just, you know, you don't really want to store data yourself, you can still use the gateway uh, local to where your applications are, because anyone can just roll their own. Uh, eventually, that's the whole point, is that this is a network of nodes where anyone can participate, and anyone can decide to build their own, their own zone, their own subnet, uh, either in their own location, or it's like, you know, a set of provi node providers that combine their resources and represent a certain geographical uh, location. So O3, the Kavi O3 is the S3 object interface. Okavi Oasis is sort of like the, uh, the decentralized network of node providers that process the data, the data managers, and also store um, a hot copy uh, in front of Filecoin. And then everything is integrated with Filecoin in a way that, you know, we, we leverage uh, Filecoin's EVM uh, for smart contracts um, because we've, you know, we've tightly integrated it in such a way that we can take advantage of all the technology stacks. One, obviously using the storage providers as a, a repository, as, a, as, a, as a, a storage tier, two, the virtual machine, uh, so the FEFM, and three, the IPC um, technology, which allows us to create very efficient subnets, and these subnets can then be optimized for 
geographical region, or it can be optimized for, in the future, even an enterprise account that wants to run their own subnet in their own location uh, and still be connected to, you know, um, the Akave network as a whole. So it sounds like you're really focusing on feature parity, um, basically providing the features that people would typically expect out of Web2 services or, or kind of your, your traditional cloud services and really trying to build these things out, um, whether it's like S3 compatibility, inter- like S3 API, that's, that's, or even just the interface, that's, that's maybe a bit more uh, user-friendly for folks who are used to using that particular service. And then also even trying to maybe create the uh, more of a customizable um, storage model, essentially. So people can come and kind of pick and choose a solution that is going to be more relevant to their particular needs. Like you're mentioning, like, oh, I want, uh, you know, two, two copies stored on the East Coast, one copy stored on the West Coast. And, right. and I, I would assume, or at least my understanding is that with, with, with you know, some of these larger uh, solutions on the market now, kind of the Web2 solutions, it's probably more of like, like a take it or leave it type of play. Like this is what we offer. And, you know, you don't really get to just kind of pick and choose a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Right. Um, maybe talk a bit about just how you're thinking about this, like this, like web two feature parody. Like how are you trying to uh, kind of give folks what they're used to now, but also give them something that's, that's ultimately better. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, look, um, S3 is just a means to an end. Uh, I just want to make that clear. It's not the, the, the full product, uh, because again, you can only move as fast as your customers want to move at times, right? And you know, you can sit there and say, "Wow, you know, we've got this amazing thing." I mean, the world should like jump on this, but you know, the majority of the businesses don't want to make that 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 jump because you know they're scared of losing their job, they're scared of like the technology they don't understand. So you have to make it very easy to them, and so to make it very easy is to talk to them in a language that they understand. And then educate them from there. And so that's why the S3 compatible API is really a means to an end. It's also why it's only one component in the stack because there's also an SDK. So we see customers coming in and they're looking at indeed what you were saying is like, hey, do you support S3? The answer is yes. Okay, check. Next, uh, do you support the ability to select a geographical location? Yes, you know, check. Next, okay, let's now talk about, you know, data protection that is translated in. Um, durability, meaning, you know, uh, the, the level of protection that you provide to your data sets and um, the availability. And so all these things are configurable. And it's then when we start talking about the future possibilities of smart contracts, because a lot of users now, which is actually, look, it's a refreshing. Last year, I didn't really see that. Um, meaning users like businesses, Web2 businesses starting to reach out and actually being intrigued about what's possible with um, blockchain-enabled storage. And actually, when you come from Web3, it's typically like, oh, what can blockchain do to me? It's less about crypto, um, which is great. You know, they sort of like understood the benefits of blockchain. And and the main reason there is it's driven by, uh, one, egress costs. They're actually feeling the pain of moving data outside the cloud. Two, um, they're distrusting the cloud because they were starting to realize my data sets are so valuable do I really trust some of these cloud providers to not use my data sets to either train their own or, you know, find insights that I've, you know, that, that are basically my IP. Um, and the third is uh, they want more control. Um, and that's interesting because when you peel back the onion, what it means is they want more flexibility and uh, data transparency. So to give you an example, um, and you kind of alluded to it, right? If you go to the cloud, you have very fixed uh, offerings. And that's great. You know, it, it made the cloud very easy to use. It made it very simple. Um, but now with data sets having different values, like basically not every data set is the same. Not every data set has the same value. Um, now users are starting to look at how can I monetize these data sets? And so when you're, um, when you're having these fixed offerings, um, meaning you have, you know, three or four services, three or four offerings from, uh, the cloud providers to store your data when it comes to tiering, um, then that may not be enough because the granularity and the level of uh, of, of where you want to set your price could be, you know, too limited for, for these users. So, for example, we had users reach out and said, hey, I want to set a different retrieval price for a different data set and actually charge users to download these data sets. And I know that some of my users 
will actually pay for that because these are high, highly curated, uh, valuable data sets. Now, you know, how do you do that with a very fixed model or very fixed um, storage um, prices? Well, you know, you can you know, kind of peanut butter spread it or you can like um, carve it up in different buckets for sure. But really what customers want is just more transparency in who is using these data sets, um, who is serving the data set, if there are different providers that are uh, actually executing on, on serving the content. And then three, like, you know, being able to set more granular pricing and how and who has access to it. Um, and so this is where Web3 comes into play because with blockchain, one, you have full um, traceability, right? Of all the data that's stored on chain, you can see where it's stored, who has access to it, um, and you can also trace much easier who's downloading it. And even though in Web2, there's so many solutions and databases that can track all of it, <clears throat> what I've learned is that it doesn't mean that it's all managed by one business unit. Um, even in Web2, you know, you have a lot of different business units with different databases and there's politics at hand. And so you don't have the full end-to-end transparency. And that's why um, we're seeing a lot more demand for, you know, the word data provenance. Like, hey, how can you help me, you know, um, create more transparency in my data sets and how it's used and stored and so on? And how do we enable data provenance with that? I'd love for you to talk a bit more about this theme of data provenance. Um, but before we do that, I'd, I'd like to maybe just talk about some, uh, like who do you envision as like early adopter use cases uh, for what you guys are building here? And maybe we can kind of weave in some of the data provenance things uh, uh, on, on the on the tail end of that. I'm just being conscious of time here. But we'd love to dive yeah. into some of like, what are like kind of the optimal use cases that, uh, you know, you see as being early adopters or potentially... Um, you know, kind of fast followers. Yeah. I mean, you're seeing a lot of deep in customers right now or deep in businesses that are popping up, right. That are very focused on um, curating data sets in a completely new way, um, you know, through devices being deployed at the edge that are collecting very specific data sets, look at hive map or look at. So those types of customers that care about uh, one, how data is being collected, how it's moved to, uh, from the content creators or the content um, curators or those that are actually collecting it all the way down to those that are consuming it or buying it. So these data marketplaces essentially could benefit from this because they're also, also still building in the cloud because it's very, very common. You, let's say you make, you, you build a data marketplace. If you have to focus on building out a full new storage layer, that's a lot of effort Um that that cannot go towards uh, building out a, pl- a marketplace itself and um, the devices that you're deploying in, in the field. So that's one. So deep in two is decentralized AI workloads. So we're or decentralized AI workloads uh, contributors. So what I mean by that is like you see we see networks um, that are doing decentralized training that care about having uh, the data stored close to the compute. And so there, it's a completely different model. I mean, because, you know, the cloud providers provide a SaaS offering, right? And you have to select what they have in, in their portfolio, meaning East, West Coast, you know. But with the adoption of decentralized AI networks where we're leveraging decentralized compute nodes, you want the storage to be stored closer to the compute so that the latency is low, so that, you know, you don't have to constantly pay for these egress costs. And there, there is a need for a decentralized storage uh, network that is more flexible where you can just spin up uh, an Akave node next to a decentralized compute node. You process what you need to process. Maybe you store it longer there because, you know, you have next jobs coming in and there's sort of like a hub of some compute nodes that, you know, will always be there. But the point is this locality is super important because, like as I mentioned before, once you start moving a lot of data around, it doesn't make sense to move it. It makes sense, more sense to store an extra copy locally. And definitely with uh, training LLMs or in doing inferencing or um, doing fine-tuning, um, you know, you, you want those data sets um, close to where your LLMs are being uh, fine-tuned. So the that's one. Um, and then we're seeing also 
those that are curating the data itself. So, um, you know, data labeling companies. Um, so actually, you know, stacks that are collecting the data sets from the web or are, you know, augmenting it with metadata to make it more efficient for those AI engineers that are looking for data sets to train their LLMs. Because, you know, you can go out there and you can collect all these YouTube videos, but if you don't know what the YouTubes represent, I mean, it, it's a lot more work for you to go through that. If you get a JSON file with metadata in there that says, okay, this is a cat, it's screaming, right? It's a cat on a bus. I mean, it's very simple, but, you know, you don't have to go through all that work of interpreting the, uh, the, the video image or the video file. And so you can immediately, you know, even take snippets out um, that you want to use to train or augment your your um, your, your LMs that, that you're trying to build. So there, um, that segment that is curating and is collecting all these data sets and doing all the work, they see uh, a lot of opportunity to, um, you know, use decentralized networks like Akave because one, it gives them a very easy on-ramp. Two, it gives them uh, data integrity. So you have this on-chain verifiability that comes natively with the stack, right? Because, on a daily basis, the data gets verified. This is one of Filecoin's primitives, right? Comes out of the box. We all take it for granted. But now it's sort of like, hey, data is being sampled. Data is being verified on a daily basis. You know, you can um, guarantee that whatever data sets you're using, there are the originals. And, you know, you can actually uh, see an on-chain proof of that. You can see an on-chain um, hash and, and even a, a, a a stamp or a date and time when, when it was last verified. So there's things that come in um, natively with the stack that are super important. So these three we're seeing, and then we have web two um, uh, companies coming in more from the innovation team side that are looking at um, rebuilding some of their business plans. Like I mentioned before, where they're looking at typically they're coming in with the problem statement that egress costs are too high. And then when you peel back the onion, it's like, well, why is it too high? Why it's because we're just like, use, you know, we're just, uh, we have one big data set, you know, um, the cost is, we don't have full control or granular control enough to charge back to the end users that are, that are consuming this data. Um, and the data sets are sort of like all over the place. So it, it's kind of hard at scale to have that level of granularity. And so they're looking at, can I reduce my cost? So the first step in most cases is like, can I just store an extra copy and save myself from a vendor lock-in situation? And then two, how can I build from that? And can I um, look at maybe new primitives, like using these new primitives in, in um, more efficiently, like charge for retrievals and, and so on. So that's where we're seeing. So, but in general, uh, in Web2, um, it's following the same trend as what happened like 17 to 20 years ago at Amazon. You have these emerging verticals like uh, media and entertainment, life science and research that are sort of at the tip of the spear and that are more interested in adopting these use cases or these technologies more because they have large data sets. They value their data sets. They understand the value of uh protecting them and they're also more uh, looking at new business plans or uh, new ways to monetize them and so that those are the verticals that that we're seeing right now um, being interested in blockchain enabled infrastructure that's super interesting and I find it interesting too that the the egress cost seems to be kind of the, the point of a universal pain that everyone's feeling uh, kind of across the different customer segments that you're talking to. And then yeah. once you peel back the onion, it's, there's all these other issues that maybe they didn't, you know, once you kind of tease it out, they, you know, they're saying like, well, we don't really have the control. We don't really have the access. We don't really have the, the ability to, uh, you know, let folks come in and, 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 and access this, you know, on, uh, if, if we would like them to. So it kind of feels like we're at this point now where, you know, they're basically saying that we're paying too much for this. And we're not getting the value that we think we should be getting out of these 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 services, and we're kind of stuck. Also, <laughs> like there's no real way out, right? Um, so it seems like that's that's a good point for uh, you know new solutions and disruption to to come along. So it seems like we're at like a a, a good point in time here. Uh, if that's if they're if the the pain the pain that they're feeling is that significant, I suppose. Um, I wanted to ask a couple of other uh, quick questions. Uh, about kind of just like the, the 
you know, kind of, I mean, you've been involved in this industry for a long time, like, you know, 20 years, as you said, you've, you've kind of seen all the trends come and go and really just interested in your view on just kind of what types of new storage bot- model business models, like really will be unlocked here in the future. And also I just have this question of, of like we're, the world, especially now in the world of, uh, of just AI and, and it's everywhere now and we're, we're the, the humanity is producing exponentially more data basically every year. But there's just a finite limit to the amount of storage and compute hardware that we can produce. And like why why are these types of distributed networks like so important in this in this context, right? Like we're we're basically producing more data than we know what to do with or that we can physically handle. So yeah. why are solutions like what you guys are building like so important in this context? Yeah, I mean like data is growing according to IDC. Data, the, the cater, right, of, of data growth is like 21.2%. Uh, most of it is coming from unstructured, so large data sets, you know, and it's only going to accelerate. Definitely with new deepened networks coming online, there's a whole new way of collecting new data sets that we were not able to do before. Um, so that's one. And if you look at the hardware vendors, they only provide 10 to 15% more efficiency for the same cost um, every 18 months, typically. So what that means is every 18 months, you're gonna get like 10 to 15% more capacity for the same price. And you know when you know that you know your data is growing at 21% or a little bit more than that every year, it's so after two years or more than 40% growth, but you only got like maybe 15 to 20% incremental efficiency from your, uh, from your hardware manufacturer. And then also there's only uh, two major hardware manufacturers left, like that's WD and um, Seagate. And yeah, Toshiba is doing a, has a little bit of the market share, but not significant enough to make a dent. Um, so then you're sort of looking at, okay, well, all my data or the majority of my data stored on that I use on a daily basis is either on a flash, or like flash drive or an HDD uh, technology or some combination of it. Now there's some com- combos now, but the point is that you know, there's two major vendors that are sort of driving the uh, the production of, of these devices that we use on a daily basis. And so then you're, um, yeah, you're, you're definitely looking at a shortage there because we can't store all the data that we produce. And now with these new foundational models and, and all these LLMs, um, you know, this data could be used and could be worth something uh, instead of removing it or deleting it. It could be stored in a more efficient uh, decentralized network. That's one. So two is also, like you said, the business models. um, And I kind of alluded to it before, right? It's like instead of, uh, let's say you have the flexibility through blockchain powered storage to control who has access and how much users should be paying for retrieving or using the data on a granular level, meaning on a file level then you can start to like build these whole new business models. And that's also what the deepen uh, uh, trend is, right? You're like curating these data sets, you're collecting them in an efficient way, and then you're selling them. But really what they're building is these data marketplaces that are very vertically focused and they have a very focused target market. Um, and so it's all about the data. It's all about, you know, the process curated data sets. And so this is where I think uh, the, the, the market's going to change where, Instead of and LLMs kind of are a condensed version of that because they're sort of like looked at as a honeypot, right? Because if you're training an LLM on your data sets and on your LLM, I mean, gets uh, stolen, um, all of a sudden you kind of lost a lot of inside IP, basically. Yeah, you know, where where five years ago was all about protecting just the data sets. Today, it's data sets plus the LLMs, right? Because you've actually uh, done all the work to train an LLM on your data set. So now this LLM is, even though it's a very small size, maybe, you know, it's maybe a hundred gigabytes in size, but the value is really high because you spend, you know, weeks on weeks and, and hundreds of thousands of uh, hours on, on training it. So it's, yeah, it's, it's highly valuable. So that's the difference. So change exchanging out or these marketplaces um, that are currently driven by deep in, I see a world where users themselves, like enterprises even, will be able to create their own marketplace and, and have set their own price. And, you know, of course, long way to go. 
Um, but this is where Kavi wants to play a game is like, you know, by enabling users with on-chain data lakes, the first step is to get the data in on-chain. That's the first step. So that's our mission. Bring these data sets on-chain and then, you know, you can take advantage of all the, the tools that come with it. So, yeah. Great. Great. Thanks for that. Uh, so let's wrap up here. Um, uh, I would just like to ask one more quick question about your roadmap. Uh, what should we expect out of Akave in the next six, 12 months? I know you guys just kind of formally launched a few months ago, uh, but have been building this out for a while and kind of in stealth. Uh, but what should we expect to see in the next six, 12 months? Yeah. Um, so the first version, we already have an Akave version out that helps users and it's production solution that helps users to store data on Falcon. Um, and that has an S3 interface, um, and that's a version two and a half. Uh, it's not fully decentralized, uh, but it is, you know, controlled by uh, Kavi Enterprise. So we have a Kavi Enterprise that's serving enterprise customers, where we uh, have a hosted instance of a Kavi fully permissioned, where we move data onto the Falcon network. Um, the second, um, the, the more the second version of a Kavi, which is a decentralized version, uh, is coming out in October. So we'll have our test net out in October. It's a um, set of nodes, um, small subnet, uh, initial subnet running on uh, multiple nodes, uh, fully built out. That will be available in October and will be running a hackathon in, um, in Bangkok for DEF CON. So meet us at that Bangkok. Uh, we're, we'll, we'd love to see everyone show up there and uh, meet in person. You can sign up to our test net as well on akave.ai. We'll find all the information. We're kind of finalizing the documentation right now. And then in the next couple of months, we'll be continuing to build out our functionality and features, um, including Marketplace. Um, and there's you know a ton of details there that are coming out. But the first step is making sure that we have our test net out so users can play around with it, can start building, and um, yeah, can give us feedback. Amazing. Uh, well, and then how can um, folks get in touch with you if they want to learn more uh, about either about yourself or about Akave? And then what yeah. types of folks are you, you, you mentioned builders and, and, and hackers and whatnot, but like what other types of folks are you looking to get in touch with right now? Or, or are you looking for like you know, folks who are interested in running nodes or uh, folks who are interested in, in you know, uh, just storing with you guys or, or using, like what, what types of, of partnerships are you looking for right now? Yeah, so we have, um, well, we have the builders that are looking to build applications. So we'll have the uh, documentation up soon, as soon as like uh, the test is up. To uh, users that are looking to move away from the cloud. I mean, we're also, we're always looking for paying customers that are willing to take the, because what we're seeing right now is some customers actually are very interested in what we're building in a decentralized way because it's almost like a must. Some come to us and say, like, hey, I will only move it if it's fully decentralized because I want there to be no dependency on a single... Because one of the benefits is when you move data into a copy, if a copy would ever go away, let's say we go away, you still have your data on chain and you can still pull it back. So that's one. So businesses that are managing large data sets and are hurting and and they want to move or store at least one copy outside of the cloud, please join us. And then partners, um, partners that are looking to design with us. Um, those are design partners that are like, hey, I love what you're doing. Would love to collaborate with you um, and uh, partnership uh, and, and partner with us on a go-to-market perspective. So we, we're working with a lot of decentralized compute stacks. Why? Because um, a lot of decentralized compute workloads, they need local storage and they need it in an in verifiable, immutable way that is still easily to, uh, easily um, um, configurable because one of the benefits is, you know, with Falcon and with Akave is that you get an immutable copy out of the, out of the gate um, and you can move that immutable copy, which is very powerful, right? You're not really stuck with like an immutable implementation in, 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 in Google or in Wasabi or, you know, no, you can actually move that data around. So, uh, Partners, just help us. Uh, we'll, we'll, we're looking forward to create reference designs for these new workloads and collaborate with you from a marketing perspective. Awesome, awesome. Well, Stefan, thank you so much for your time. It's really awesome hearing about Akave, and uh, thank you for sharing all your insights. Really learned a lot here. And uh, thanks everyone for watching, and we will see you next time on DWeb Decoded.